John, I mean, give us a bit more sense in terms of the timeline of this collaboration with KHC to deliver a Four Seasons in that part of Saudi Arabia. Well, good. Good morning and thank you for having me. So, yes, we're pleased to be announcing the deal with uh, Kingdom Holdings. It's a deal that's been several months in the making, but the project has already started. And so we'll be delivering the project to open in the early part of 2025. So uh, we're really excited to be partnering with them. They're a great investor. Obviously, they're a big uh, investor in uh, Four Seasons, so the combination is super great for us as, uh, as Red Sea Global. The price tag here, or the value of the collaboration, is around 2 billion Saudi rials. I'm wondering, as you add to that supply, and we'll speak about some of the longer-term goals, uh, we would just got news of the latest developments in uh, Israel or around the Gaza Strip, and uh, it's weighing on some of the conversations here. To what extent is it going to affect some of your plans in terms of getting tourists to come to Saudi Arabia? Well, clearly it's a worry and it's, you know, war is never a good thing. So we hope that uh, common sense will prevail and, uh, you know, the war will come to an end shortly. Um, but we have a very strong domestic market as well. I mean, we're opening up, we've opened up the destination, which we announced last week. Um, but it's a soft opening. We've opened up three small resorts. And the balance of the project isn't going to be delivered until 2025. So I think hopefully by then things will have settled. But in any event, as I said, we have a very strong domestic market, which I think we'll see us through the early stages of the operation of the destination. So it's still full steam ahead on all of your project fronts? Absolutely. Despite everything that is happening? Indeed. Okay. Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit more about the, the feeder markets. Again, for our global investing audience watching today, to kind of you know, understand where the demand is going to come from. Well, as I said, look, I think our, in our overall strategy, we expect a 50-50 split between domestic and regional travelers and, and international travelers. Obviously, Western Europe is, is going to be a strong market for us and some of the Asian markets as well. I mean, the further afield you go, obviously, the capture rate is going to be smaller just simply because of travel time and people's you know, ability to, to spend that amount of time in, in getting to a destination. But I think 50-50 with a large emphasis on Europe for our international visitors. Uh, at Bloomberg, we love numbers. And we know that uh, the initial project cost estimate was around $24 billion when it was first announced for the totality of that project. Do you have any rough guidance on Red Sea tourism in terms of revenues for 2024? Well, 24 is going to be a soft year for us. As I said, we've opened up three resorts, which are relatively small. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, the numbers are going to be relatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. What about the financing? I mean, initially you were relying on feeder capital from the PIF. You've said repeatedly that you would like that to transition to bringing private players in more and then eventually possibly an IPO. Let's get to the part where... You either issue another bond. I mean, are you are you in the game for that? When would that take place? Okay, so as you know, we did raise a, a debt facility uh, a couple of years ago, 14 billion rial, which was the largest Saudi-denominated green loan. Um, and we will be coming to the market early next year. Red Sea Global has expanded its ambitions from just the Red Sea project to Amala and now numerous other projects around the whole of the kingdom, including one we've just announced, which is Thuo. Um, so we will be deploying additional forms of capital for these, these new projects. As I said, Amala will come out next year with a debt facility, not dissimilar to the size of the facility that we already raised for the Red Sea project. Roughly how much? About $14 billion. And then in terms of an IPO, I mean, the kingdom or you know, the crown prince has made no secret about wanting more capital to get deployed here in Saudi Arabia. It's part of the reason why uh, FII is hosted every year here in Riyadh. When could an IPO happen from Red Sea Global? Could you put a year on that? Well, look, I think realistically it'll be, you know, three or four years down the road. Because with, with a project like Red Sea, which is obviously hospitality driven, we need to open the destination. We need to stabilize the income, have a, obviously a track record of, of income before you can realistically tap the markets. So I would be guessing somewhere around 28 29 would be when we would come to it for a public offering. But we'll be looking at many other ways of, of raising capital in the meantime. I said the, the, the JV with Kingdom Holdings is another way to raise capital. We brought in a private sector investor. We've signed two different uh, design, build, operate, transfer agreements for our utilities with uh, Aqua Power on the Red Sea. And we just announced a, a, a month or so ago a, a joint venture with EDF and Mazdar to deliver our utilities infrastructure where they're deploying their own capital from various sources. So different ways to raise investment into the, uh, into the project and into the kingdom. John, a, a lot of your efforts are also centered around raising awareness uh, to what is going on in the projects over there. What's the marketing budget like for next year, and where are you going to prioritize that? 
Well, the marketing budget is going to ramp up as we start to approach the full opening of the first phase of the project. As I said, we're going to open the first phase in early 2025, so you know we'll have a significant spend next year, probably in the order of 25 to 50 million dollars. I've got one closing question mm -hmm. here, just in terms of the zero-sum game potentially of inbound tourists into the Gulf, because you've got Dubai, you've got the Abu Dhabi offering, mm -hmm. and some other Gulf countries are also trying to reinvent the wheel, as it were. Is it a zero-sum game, or do you think that you know what you can take from there, you can give here? Look, I think I think we're offering something very different. I think Dubai and Abu Dhabi are very successful at what they do. We're positioning ourselves as something truly different. We have a, a pristine environment. We're investing heavily in regenerative development in order to protect and preserve our precious environment. And I think it's increasingly, it's feeding into an increasingly growing market where travelers want to travel more sustainably. So here they have an opportunity to come somewhere that's absolutely beautiful and stunning with thriving coral reefs mm -hmm. and actually do it in a manner that is actually complementary to the planet. So we're going to take care of planet and people. And I think it's going to resonate well. So I don't see it as a zero-sum game.